pretty big crowd. I wasn't expecting this. There weren't this many people when I was in this room taking classes a few years ago. Um, I came here today to talk about applied and innovative approaches to reclamation, but from my perspective. So there's a ton of different fantastic innovations that are going on in the reclamation industry, but I'm only here today to talk about my experiences within the last two to three, maybe up to five years. So keep that in mind as we're going through the presentation. The first thing I wanted to start with was some definitions. When I think about innovation and technology, it isn't necessarily something that brings reclamation to the forefront of my mind. It kind of conjures images of entrepreneurs and groundbreaking scientific discoveries. Or when we think about technology, I think more about remediation technologies than I do about reclamation. And so when ARC transferred to AITF, we took on this new mandate. And innovates and technology is actually in our name. So I thought I better get a better handle of how that's going to apply to reclamation. So I thought it was kind of suiting that Francis asked me to talk about this particular topic. So with respect to AITF, I just wanted to give you an insight into what we do within AITF, and particularly as it relates to our mandate in the province. So AITF is a part of Alberta's research and innovation system and is helping to build healthy, sustainable businesses in the province through a suite of programs and services for entrepreneurs, companies, researchers, and investors, AITF provides technical services and funding support to facilitate the commercialization of technologies, to develop new knowledge-based industry clusters, and to enc encourage an entrepreneurial-based culture in Alberta. It doesn't really suit or, you know, think reclamation when you hear that statement. So I came up with the task of actually identifying how we fit within that role so that we were making a valuable contribution not just to the province but also to our organization. So innovation in general just means applying something new whether that's a piece of equipment, a technology or a method. So it actually does suit what we do very well because our role specifically within our division is to test and deploy new technologies and processes that help build commerce in Alberta while reducing environmental impacts. So for discussion today, we're going to talk about how that relates to applied reclamation. And when I talk about applied reclamation, I'm talking about things that are making an impact at an operational level. Whether that's a very small operation in terms of an entrepreneur that wants to validate a technology, or it's actually at a very large scale oil sands development that wants to adopt a new way of doing reclamation. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about applied reclamation. So as we're going through the different areas of topics today, I want you to keep in mind from that perspective how to make innovations applied. So what we do here at the university is not necessarily always going to be directly transferable to a field application level immediately. There may be things that we have to do in order to upscale to an operational level. And then how that science changes to be able to implement and transfer that knowledge to an operational level at a faster rate. So I'm going to give you some examples from my perspective for the oil and gas industry. And when I talk about the oil and gas industry, I'm talking about conventional oil and gas well sites and pipelines. In situ oil sand development, it's definitely not my area of expertise, but I found some really fantastic new innovations in that industry itself. The mineable oil sands, and there's people in this room as well as associated with the university that are doing a lot more innovative approaches to reclamation in the oil sands than I can necessarily speak to. But from our perspective, we're doing one that I think that is pretty fantastic and we're actually working with the university to make that even more applied. Remediation, and I'm sure that you can think of a, a thousand different examples of fantastic applications for new remediation technologies. So I'm just going to give you a few examples from mine. Amendments, and as Ellen suggested, amendments are kind of dear to my heart because that's where I've done a lot of my focused research. And so I'm going to give you some new ideas of what amendments might be applicable at an operational level and, of course, talk about some of the new technologies that we've been either trying out or potentially looking at using. So for the oil and gas industry, I don't know how many people are actually familiar with the industry, but it's a regulatory-driven industry. What that means is that it deters innovation to a degree because operators are generally trying to meet a specific regulatory criteria and there's very little incentive to go above and beyond that. The only thing that's actually really spurring them to come up with new innovative approaches to reclamation 
are as if there's an economic benefit to it. So if they can do and achieve the same level of criteria requirements at a cheaper cost, they're totally in. If there's a social benefit to it, so in other words, if it increases their social license to operate, they're more likely to pick up and adopt a new type of innovation or technology. From our perspective, one of the things that we've been working on recently is guideline validation and risk assessment or management limits. And in a regulatory-driven industry, this is one of the ways that we're seeing a lot of innovation actually occurring to ensure that we are applying the right types of regulations and criteria to whether that be reclamation from a certification perspective or from a remediation perspective. So I'll give you a little insight of how we've been doing some of our research to make sure that it's directly transferable at an operational level that can actually have an impact of the way we're doing our reclamation practices in the field. About two years ago, we started on a project for PTAC, the Petroleum Technical Alliance of Canada, on validating the stratified remediation subsoil criteria. So if anybody is familiar with the Tier 1 criteria, you'll know that there is a clause within the document that says that you're allowed to have a different level of contamination within five meters of a wellhead radius below 1.5 meters. That criteria for petroleum hydrocarbon contamination. That criteria wasn't necessarily based on science. All of the surface contamination information that has been prepared is based on ecotoxicity validation. So basically we're talking about earthworms. At what concentration do petroleum hydrocarbons have an effect on um, invertebrates? But when you get down to the 1.5 meter depth, you might be able to remove some of those receptor pathways and be able to change the appropriate level of contamination that can stay in place. So when you think about what that means at an applied level, you can consider if there's a, a concentration that's a little bit above guideline levels right now and you're going to remove an entire meter and a half to two meters of soil just to reduce that by a few hundred parts per million, is it really worth the ecological disturbance than leaving it there if there are no receptors that are potentially going to be harmed by it? So for this particular experiment, in order to make this at an applied level, we had to use large-scale column experiments. We considered doing it outside, but we wanted to create a worst-case scenario to ensure that the roots were growing down into a contaminated medium uh, for as long as possible. So we used two-meter-tall columns, 30-centimeter diameters, with two different soil treatments and two different types of hydrocarbon contamination, the F2 fraction and the F3 fraction. And for those of you that don't know, the F2s are C10 to C16, hydrocarbon length chains, and F3s are C16 to C34. So what that means is that we're going to evaluate how well much interaction the roots are going to have at a contaminated level. So we contaminated 50 centimeters of soil at the bottom of the column and put one and a half meters of clean fill on top. And if you take a look here, you can see, kind of get an idea of the amount of soil that we're taking out of these columns. It's an extremely large feat to take a two meter tall column out of a sunken greenhouse, cut it open to be able to do biomass analysis on the root biomass, and then come up with methods that you're going to be able to have a statistically valid design. So we used two different crop species. We had um, canola and alfalfa, and we're just finishing up the experiment right now. So we are just finishing the root washing component of it. From an above ground biomass perspective, we actually didn't see any kind of um, statistical differences between the controls and the contaminated substrates. That's for canola and alfalfa. We had fantastic root growth throughout the columns. The roots were well down into the contaminated zone, but it didn't necessarily affect the above ground biomass. From a below ground biomass, I don't have complete results yet, but it is looking like on a first glance, we're seeing statistical significance with the F3 contamination. So we actually are going to potentially have an effect at that level of contamination, which was neighboring around guideline levels for the F3 component. From a risk management, um, risk assessment management limit perspective, this is another great example of how we can use good science to be able to make a difference at an applied level. For the green zone subsoil management limits, in Alberta we have the tier one criteria, tier two criteria, and management limits. And you're allowed to use the other limits if you can reduce or eliminate um, uh, receptor pathways. So for this particular study, 
we were cooperating with PTAC and Millennium EMS Solutions with um, validating the type of level of contamination that we can see in subsoil in the green zone. So the first thing that we need to do is identify what the receptor pathways are. Miles Tyndall did a fantastic job at identifying at what depth the species within the green zone are actually going to be um, exposed to this type of a contamination level. And then if they, we can remove that receptor pathway, what level of contamination would be deemed appropriate based on uh, considerations such as free phase hydrocarbon formation, fire and explosion hazards, and hydrophobicity. And it's interesting to determine which one of those particular parameters might actually drive the management limit. So what we did was we set up an experiment with coarse and fine textured soils, two moisture contents to basically consider the worst and uh, best case scenario, if you want to call it a best case scenario, and F2 and F3 hydrocarbons again. The reason why we're concentrating on those fractions is because they're generally the driving factors in a remediation project. F1s tend to volatilize and F4s generally don't tend to be the driving force. So what we did was we set it up in a column experiment in the lab with um, the hydrocarbons that were dyed with Sudan red dye. But one of the limitations of this type of an experiment is that we're manipulating the soil. In order to create a homogeneous material that can be used in a column experiment for statistical validity, we had to homogenize it. So all of a sudden we're changing the inherent properties of the soil that creates a difficulty in taking it out to the field level. But in order to establish the science behind establishing a management limit, it was felt that it was necessary. So from this particular project's perspective, what we have been finding is that for the F3 component, it's going to be more of a hydrophobicity I issue that's going to drive the management limits. And for the F2s, it's going to be free phase formation of hydrocarbons. And when I say free phase, I mean at what point um, is the contamination level going to cause a risk to the mobility of the hydrocarbon? At what point does it overcome the capillary forces within the soil? Well, within still the oil and gas industry, we can move on to remediation. And I think that one of the most fascinating things about remediation is that there are so many different ways that you can apply remediation technologies to a similar type of contaminant. And what was once considered economical can actually now be considered feasible. And I think a fantastic example of that is thermal desorption. When I was going through my undergrad, it was completely uneconomical. No one was considering doing it because it just didn't make sense. <coughs> Things have changed. Thermal desorption is actually now being widely used in the U.S. for chlorinated compounds. And I was recently at a conference where an Australian company, um, These Services, did a project with hundreds of thousands of tons of material in Sydney where they were evacuating um, hole, excavating holes as well as dredging the bottom of the seafloor and using thermal desorption as their remediation technology which was really great because what was able to make that project go forward was the fact that the property value could c cover the cost of the remediation. More recently, we've been working with companies that are looking at alternative ways to produce the energy to create a thermal desorption process. So one of the limiting factors with thermal desorption is the cost of the fuel that's required to run the process. If we can use alternate technologies to be able to form the energy that's going to drive the process, there's a lot more potential applications for it. So when I'm talking about waste products, I'm not just talking about wood biomass, it can be any kind of waste product that can be put into the system to create a, a heat source. And this technology wasn't quite ready for commercialization, but with the right kind of engineering, it's a fantastic concept. Plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. This is something that's absolutely fascinating to me, and it can be used for multiple different reasons. One for phytoremediation, another for liability reduction. So what these guys are doing on a site, and I'm no microbiologist, but I understand what the practical implications of using this type of a technology is at an applied operational level. So what we've done is we've been able to show that with in creating a, a consortium of micro microorganisms that are beneficial for plant growth, whether they're changing the stress of the, in, of the plant or allowing it to grow in different types of medium, 
then we're actually going to have two opportunities. One, we can actually create a reduction in the contamination level, and the other is a liability reduction. Some of these sites that are contaminated, companies would rather just sit on them because they're so highly contaminated or they're so remote that it's going to cost way too much at this point in time to remediate that they'd rather just leave them on their books. So if we can actually cause a reduction in the contamination level, then we can reduce the liability for that particular company. We have a system in Alberta with a voluntary remediation certification program, and if we can certify a certain portion of that site that it's been remediated to acceptable levels, they can reduce their liability on that particular site and potentially be able to move on to other sites where they don't want to accept as much liability. This has been well developed by university professors at the University of Waterloo with the PEP system, the PGPR enhanced, um, enhanced phytoremediation system but they're only doing it from a perspective of a consulting purpose. So they're going out and they're conducting the remediation, having fantastic success, but it can be bigger than that. From a commercialization perspective, all oil and gas companies could potentially benefit from this, and consultants could be using this on a regular basis. So what we're doing with NAITF is looking at the opportunities to commercialize a product that could then be sold to anybody for any type of application for reclamation purposes. And that's a very significant difference because what we're trying to do is create more opportunities from an applied level. This is a really neat technology that was recently introduced to us, fungal technology for soil bioremediation. And this is a kind of remediation technology that's gaining momentum in the last couple of years. And this particular company, EcoChem, is a Finnish company that contacted us to determine if there was any potential for applications in Canada and Alberta specifically. And what they're doing is they've created soil tubes that are filled with a particular type of nutrient regime and allowing the fungi to grow within those tubes, inserting them either into biopiles or directly in situ into an oil lease, and allowing the fungi to remediate the hydrocarbons. They've been using it on all kinds of different um, persistent organic uh, pollutants, but for particular applications here, we're looking at the opportunities for Alberta. And from a remediation perspective, this is just a brief insight into what we've been working on in the last couple of years. There are so many more. And I was extremely impressed with the level of innovation that I've seen in this industry, particularly at the more recent Remtech conference. And they have all of their presentations available online. And there's examples of in situ salt remediation, phytoremediation, stabilization, and solidification. And it was really inspiring to see consultants, industry, academics all together talking about the remediation efforts that they've been seeing at an applied level. Moving on to soil amendments. So soil amendments still probably most applicable in the oil and gas industry. That's why I still stuck it into this category. And for, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to go through three. Biochar which is a carbon-rich residue produced by low oxygen pyrolysis from biomass. So for those of you that don't know, it's basically heating up a, any type of carbon-based biomass in a system in the absence of oxygen to create three different types of products, a bio-oil, a syngas, and a solid product that has properties beneficial for um, soil applications. So in this particular instance, I have examples of all kinds of different um, biochar produced from feedstocks such as wood chips, wheat straw, rice husks, um, pulp sludge. And all of the properties of the materials change when you have a different feedstock and is also if you change the properties of the pyrolysis system. But in general, biochar has a high cation exchange capacity. It reduces nutrient leaching which has an impact on water quality. It enhances water retention, reduces chemical fertilizer application requirements. It ha increases um, soil aeration and improves microbial activity within the soil and has been shown by field trials that we've set up to increase yield on marginal land. One of the other things from an oil and gas perspective that biochar has potential benefits for is carbon sequestration. So. All of the industry right now is currently talking about their carbon footprint and what that actually is going to mean and looking for new opportunities and innovations to be able to reduce their carbon footprint. Biochar 
Of course, it's going to be dependent on its feedstock and pyrolysis conditions, but can have a portion of it that's going to be resistant to degradation, so-called fixed carbon or, rec or recalcitrant carbon. And what that means is that if it's 70 to 80 percent fixed carbon, you can say that that's going to be permanent within the soil and you can get potential carbon offset credits through the Alberta offset system. There are some science limitations to this that need to be addressed prior to getting a protocol approved through the system and we're working with university professors right now to set up those trials to ensure that we are basing the decisions on good science. But what this means is that companies could potentially use biochar to ameliorate their sites in addition to being able to reduce their carbon footprint, which is an in innovation in itself. Why aren't we using biochar big scale right now? Because it's difficult to handle. I meant to bring some with me to show you today. It pulverizes in your hand. It's a, car it's a, it's a char material, so it's very difficult to ensure that it's easy to transport out to a site, very difficult to apply. You pretty much have to incorporate it because it's going to be blown away in winds like we saw yesterday. So what we need to be able to do and what we're working on now, and I just got funding for it yesterday, is to pelletize it. So we're going to agglomerate it, create a product that can then be applied through conventional seed application or fertilizer application equipment that doesn't have to be incorporated. Just distribute it on the site at the same time that you're seeding it and you're good to go. So we're just in the processes of making sure that it has an operational applied application. Another one more recently that people have been coming to me with is humic substances. And I mean, this isn't groundbreaking. We've been using humic substances for reclamation since we started doing reclamation. But what has been interesting is the changes that we've seen and the sources that we're getting the humic substances for. So when you think about a humic substance, you can think, well, the first one that comes to my mind is peat applications. The oil sands industry has been using peat as their organic source since they started doing reclamation. But more, more recently, I've been getting interest from companies that are developing um, humic substances from, from more unique sources. The first one is uh, laternite, and it's a humic substance, a type of oxidized immature coal. When you look at this diagram here, you can see that this is how it's going to form, and this is how all of our coals form. It goes from peat to a lignite to a coal. And this lignite is the typical type of coal that we're seeing down in the southern U.S. All of the coals in Texas are basically a lignite. They don't have a very um, good heat capacity to them, unlike our coals here, which are more the bituminous coals or the subbituminous coals that are, have a much higher heating value to them. But in association with those much higher quality coals, there's always going to be something on the, on the peripheral of a seam that's going to more closely resemble lignite. And it's been recently mined to produce humic substances that are then used in reclamation. And there's a couple of companies right now that are selling things like humic acid that's produced from this lignite in a liquid form that's got a fairly easy application. It can be taken to remote sites and offer additional benefits to those sites from an easy application perspective. There's also this um, laternite that is basically a complex mixture of humic and fulvic acids, and it has very similar benefits as biochar. So a high ion exchange capacity, it can retain water, and it's been used and proven in the agricultural sector for some time. These products can also be used to enhance phytoremediation because they're going to bind with some of the potential contaminants in the soil and hold them there for the plants to be able to uptake them and increase our phytoremediation capacity. And lastly, from an amendment perspective, is the pulp and paper mill effluent. And this is something that you may have heard me speak about before. I'm just referring to pulp sludge. So it's a humic substance. It's a byproduct of the pulping process. It consists primarily of water, wood fiber, or lignin, basically, biomass, and residual process and wastewater from the treatment process. I've worked predominantly with the mechanical pulp and paper industry, where the chemicals that are being added are just basically nitrogen and phosphorus during the pulping process. And some of the properties of the, the pulp sludge are listed there. And we've been doing agricultural and forest-related applications for a long time and shown the benefits of using this material for 
um, soil applications. And we have a whole bunch of information available on the website that describes the benefits of this material. But we haven't really been using it for reclamation in the past. And that's largely just because it's people have been unaware of its availability or just hasn't been proven in that particular industry. So what we're doing right now is we've set up a soil amendment experiment in collaboration with Boreal, um, Nate's Boreal Research Institute in Peace River, where we're going to try to develop best management practices for uh, well site reclamation in the boreal zone. And we're going to apply the various different amendments that we've been working on recently to um, two different types of sites, a coarse textured and a fine textured site, and be able to use the results to be able to inform decisions at an operational level. So moving on from the oil and gas conventional industry and into in situ oil sands development, like I said, this is definitely not an area that I have a lot of experience in. But one of the things that I found really fascinating about this industry recently is that I was touring oil sands exploration sites. And these sites are fairly different than conventional well sites in that they have a very short-term disturbance. They're drilled and abandoned within a month. So we're not worrying necessarily as much about the seed source propagule bank within the topsoil. And I saw really fantastic um, innovations being applied, you know, things like rough topography, appropriate slopes, the use of coarse woody debris. I saw really great initiatives to try different planting techniques to be diff successful on different types of sites, things like planting on the higher mounds, loose planting, or even potentially using compost tea bags and what that's going to do to the economics of planting a site like this. But one of the things that I found most interesting about the innovation requirements in this particular industry isn't necessarily the science or the technologies that we're applying to reclamation. It was actually the knowledge transfer to the people on the ground doing the reclamation. So in general, we're not the ones that are planting the tree or operating the cat. And one of the biggest limitations when that kind of activity is occurring is that it can be somewhat permanent or it, it can require a lot of money to redo. So the, the companies and the consultants that were out there doing the work said that that was actually one of the things that they had to be the most innovative about, was actually teaching the people using the equipment or planting the trees. We went to one site that had an insane amount of jack pine planted on it because the tree planters get paid by the tree. And so it was absolutely ridiculous from a reclamation perspective, but because of the way the system was set up, if we were to... You know, the consultant said, you know what, I don't do that. I pay them by the hour, I teach them how to do it, and I show them exactly what my site should look like at the end of the day. And it turns out that it's a much more successful project. So I thought that that was really interesting, as it wasn't necessarily the science that they were lacking in, it was actually teaching the people doing the reclamation that made a significant difference. And we as reclamation specialists need to be thinking about how we're going to translate our information out. From a mineable oil sands perspective, I spend a lot of time in the oil sands and I really, really enjoy the opportunity to work there because, in my opinion, it's something that we can, as reclamation specialists, can really have a significant difference in applying reclamation techniques to. And one of the things that we've been working on for the past several years is using carbon measurements for capping and reclamation strategy comparisons. This is kind of a novel... Um, idea on the ground to be doing the measurements that entail above ground biomass um, calculations, extrapolating it to the below ground biomass, and trying to quantify the different carbon pools, so the litter, the dead wood, the soil organic matter, and looking at what that means in terms of the transfer of carbon from one pool to another as we progress through the successional pathways. So we've been using this to compare different types of reclamation strategies with natural um, analogs. And it's been a discussion in the oil sands industry for a very long time. What are our natural analogs that we should be making comparisons to? But for this particular perspective, we're basically looking to be able to establish something that's going to look in the long term like something that is a mature forest. So we're actually able to look at what that's going to mean in terms of trajectories by measuring the different carbon pools within the system. The thing that I like most about this particular 
um, technique is that it can be very, very broad or it can be very, very specific. We're measuring everything from a tree level up and then categorizing it up as high as, you know, a class called above ground biomass, which can include all of the shrubs and the trees on a site. And the reason why I think that that's really great is because we can start to look at how it's influencing individual parameters and how that's being compared to um, the natural analogs. Another thing that I think that is fantastic about this type of work is that I have heard so many times that people are considering that the fact that the peat is being used in reclamation means that in 10 years, poof, it's gone, that it's going to degrade. It's a very different type of organic source than what's conventionally found in, in boreal soils. And this kind of uh, measurement-based approach proves otherwise. We have soils that are 30 years old that are on reclaimed sites that are not showing that kind of uh, um, trend at all. Some of the technologies that we've been applying in any of these industries that I've talked about um, include the LICOR soil respiration monitoring equipment, which I think is an absolutely brilliant innovation that's being now applied to the reclamation industry. We've been using it for all of our um, uh, carbon work in the oil sands. And this is basically a picture of it here. This is a flux survey chamber that we measure soil respiration on a monthly basis. So we're basically measuring outputs in addition to inputs. I forgot to mention that. And we also have long-term monitoring stations that are set up to measure respiration flux on an hourly basis throughout the entire growing season. We've also applied this type of a technology to other kinds of applications, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, digital soil penetration meters and penetration resistance has been something that's been somewhat criticized in the past, by myself included actually, because it's so subjective. It's a very difficult measurement to ensure consistency and um, accuracy. So one of the things that we were looking at for this particular um, technology was relative comparisons. So when you think about bulk density and using penetration resistance as a measure of bulk density, it might potentially have benefit for oil and gas monitoring. So anybody familiar with the new criteria that's being used to um, certify sites, whether that's forested, cultivated, or um, grassland areas, will know that bulk density is not one of the measurements that we're doing. The reason for that is because of the inherent variability in the sampling. There's human error as well as sample error, and it's too difficult to ensure the accuracy of the information that's being prepared. Penetration resistance, if you consider using it on and off-site for comparisons, might potentially be able to overcome that, and something that we've been looking at recently. Mostly because in the last two years, there has been such an interest in using remote sensing and proximal soil sensors to be able to increase our capability of monitoring some of these reclaimed sites. And with that being said, it kind of leads us into the, the Varus P4000 hydraulic probe, which is a really interesting piece of technology that gets attached to a core truck. And it measures electrical conductivity, P, um, soil carbon, and penetration resistance with depth and time. So I haven't even taken it out of the box yet, so I don't know how it works, but I look forward to being able to validate how well it compares to conventional ways that we've been sampling those particular parameters in the past. And then one of the other technologies that we've been implementing is lab simulations for monitoring. This particular setup comes from a really different way of looking at reclamation. This was for a carbon capture and storage project. And carbon capture and storage isn't necessarily something you think about when you think about reclamation. But in general, I think that it has fantastic implications because we need to be planning for reclamation before there's actually a disturbance. So a colleague of mine, Jim Bridey at AITF, is working on public assurance monitoring for carbon capture and storage projects. And what that means is that he is trying to get a handle on, in an injection site, when CO2 is being injected, what are the baseline soil flux conditions for that particular site, for the multiple different types of soil, under multiple different kind of weather conditions. And to do that in the field is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a huge time commitment. There's multiple soil types, and you can't necessarily guarantee that you're going to cover off all of the temperature and moisture conditions. Being able to simulate that with the different types of soil horizons in the lab allows you to be able to 
measure it under all of those various conditions and relate that right back into the field. And we did a comparison last year where we actually showed that there was a very, very positive direct relationship between the lab simulation and field measurements under those similar conditions. This type of an application is also relevant for any kind of monitoring in terms of oil sands monitoring where we're developing reclamation prescriptions and being able to look at what the different manipulations for that particular uh, soil type might be. And lastly, the innovation that I think is changing face of, the face of reclamation is collaboration. In the last couple of years, I've seen so much more of an interest in collaboration that it's actually going to result, in my opinion, in significant changes in the reclamation industry. This industry in the past has been somewhat competitive when you think about industries not necessarily wanting to collaborate together, the coal mining industry perhaps not thinking that they had any information to contribute to the conventional oil and gas industry, and vice versa. And so I think that this, you may not think of this as an innovation in itself, but I, I think it's a fantastic addition to the way we're doing work now, and I'd like to see it continue to, to grow and, and become more of a focus. So if anybody has any questions, I probably went over time as I generally do. So you're welcome to, to catch me. I'm booked off for today for this, so I'll be here. <laughs>